Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to Let's Play the Red Strings Club. Uh, before we start off today, just a couple of content warnings up front. This episode is going to bring up uh, topics like self-harm, suicide, sexual assault, um, transphobia, xenophobia, and racism. So last time we talked Johanna out of jumping off the bridge and she came back with Brandi and agreed to help us out with preventing SPW from going online. Uh, now this is going to be our final conversation in the bar before we go into the end game. And Akar is just commenting on how heated our our discussion with Edgar Coldstream got last time. What skeezes us out the most about this? If it gets out, humanity's doomed, it being in the wrong hands, but this feels very much like Donovan's truth. That it can affect him as a, a non-implant user. That he gets no say, no consent in all of this. His consent or non-consent does not matter. It can affect him either way. Which, like, even if you buy Diana's argument about the terms of service thing, that only applies to implant wearers. And even that's a really nebulous argument for affirmative consent to SPW. Donovan and other non-implant wearers don't get any of that. And now they're asking if we don't stop SBW because they're the ultimate linchpin for it and their hands are going to be on the wheels for regulating this, they're getting input from Donovan about what they should and should not do. Like, should I allow depression to exist? Should I allow people the choice to commit suicide? Should I allow rape to occur? Should I allow murder? Should I let people commit murder? There, there we go. And it forces us, both Donovan and the player, to take hard stances. In spite of the fact that we don't... That we've spent the game um, ostensibly or, or likely arguing for individual liberty and freedom. We've recognized the entire reason why SPW is a purpose, and yet we have to take some stances as a backup plan here. And this is such a good response. My analysis hadn't indicated you were that stupid to the question, should women be allowed to remain oppressed? And if you take that third option, which is, what? Women aren't oppressed? Oh, that's so good. Maybe you're just against how they plan to use it. No, I said all that just in case we fail to stop it from happening. But you could have told me uh, to not affect people at all, and it would be as if you did succeed. We also don't get the option to do that, so the this moment doesn't work as effectively as this gotcha you the player and you Donovan are being a hypocrite. It works more as a criticism of Donovan uh, but we didn't really get a choice. We didn't we didn't get a true choice. We got a contrived set. I have, I have some other thoughts on that uh, that'll be more relevant once we get to the end of the game. Uh, in the meantime, before we actually get into that final endgame sequence, I found this great article on Wireframe about uh, how well the Red Strings Club handles exposition. And I, I would like to highlight some of the, its points because, damn, they, they really cut right in. Uh, also, the fact that this is apparently based on a manga called Bartenders that I'd never heard of. And the article is about how uh, how the bartending minigame here gamifies exposition because you have to figure out what emotional state will steer the person you're talking towards into giving you the information that you want or need. And it creates this meta choice that you're making beyond uh, just picking the dialogue options. And success is determined by pairing the right meta choice with the right conversation topic. 
and then all that the text explaining the plot that comes after is technically dry exposition, but it's cloaked. It's kind of disguised. In this context, it's a reward for playing the game in a certain way. It's not just like a, a contrived walk and talk sequence or something like that, or a, a clumsy feeling dump of exposition. So we're learning about a possible complication to our plan to break into Supercontinent and hack everything. Which is that, uh, Supercontinent works off of landline technology. That's what we would have had to get calls from our grandparents. Yeah. So, all of Brandeis, uh, super high-tech equipment is kind of nullified by that. By obsolete technology. But, he says, his specialty is social engineering. He is a Vomod implant to impersonate people's voices. So the next major obstacle is the new CEO. We have learned nothing about them. We just know that Gainer is out of the picture. We got no information about the new CEO. The new CEO is a 15-year-old girl named Radika. She's not our CEO yet. Our lawyers are working on that. So Jack B. Gainer is still on paper as current CEO. She's a trotigy trained under a super secret program. She's more intelligent than the three of them put together, is how Johanna puts it. An incredibly intelligent young sociopath. And if we're going to mess with the MA, we're going to have to deal with her in some way at some point. Don't sweat it. You know I always land on my feet. Okay, so Brandeis is going to take the wheel from here. Everybody else is going to rest up and get ready for tomorrow when everything kicks off. And it's going to be another Brandeis POV section. Uh, it's a really good one, too. Oh, and, he, and Brandeis is going to give Donovan a special massage after all this is over. Hell yeah, I fucking earned it. <laughs> and Akara can try to recreate some biometric profiles of people who have been in the club. And this is how we're going to get everybody's voices to impersonate to deal with the landline problem. And we get a freebie to start. Uh, just one to start us off out of a potential seven that we can get. And so we're going to choose Larissa. Oh, I love this sequence. This is such a cool one. It's it's the most like a puzzle. And it uses dialogue and manipulation through voice impersonation for those puzzle elements. It's really good. You're essentially trying to deceive the right people in the right way to get exactly the information that you need to move forward and it relies on your reasoning skills a little trial and error uh, and, and paying attention to the characters who came through the doors of the red strings club and just knowing like what drives them what type of people are they what do they think of each other and of course where they sit on the, the chain of authority at supercontinent And so this is another way of creating a meta choice via matching. And in this case, we're not matching the right emotional state to the right topic of conversation. We're, we're doing that with voices instead, which inherently kind of lends it more of an air of, of surreptitiousness in a way, doesn't it? 
Okay, so we have... Oh, we also have to figure out people's phone numbers manually. Like, that's some of the important information that we actually have to get. Uh, we have Karen from HR, who is going to be a big contact point. We have a couple of things strewn throughout the office that will give us hints about uh, where to start. And a couple of things that we need to know. Uh, like somewhere around here is the office number, which is actually important for later. It's how we got the initial phone number. And there are a couple of other things. Like this memo over here before we get started on the phone calls. Since you complained about the computer ruining your feng shui, I had it installed in a secret compartment. Activate it from your phone. It's all sevens to hit the jackpot. So the computer terminal will reveal itself if we dial in 777-777-777. And this is really nice. This keeps track of who we can call. And then in the lower left is who we can impersonate. So we've unlocked the screen. We can turn things on. And this is the domain that Brandi is a lot more comfortable with. First, we actually have to break into the computer. And since we don't know the password, we have a couple of options to guess, but none of them are right. So this is the very first thing that we have to go and figure out. So, as Larissa, we're going to call Karen from HR and see if they can reset our password or if they know what it was changed to or what. Or rather, what it is. Finally gotta go out and unwind a little. Hey, our health insurance covered your gender calibrators in the end, right? It wasn't right that you were spending such a fortune on him. If you have a problem again, just let me know. This Karen girl seems to be fond of Larissa. So what do we need? I need to contact Adrian Ferguson, who is the chief technical officer. Uh, he's the one who can help us with this. And it's easy enough. We could have probably called Karen up as mostly anyone and gotten that information. Larissa is a good starting point for other reasons, though. Now, as Johanna, uh, we are going to call Adrian at 555-69-nice-3-030. Uh, zero, zero. And Adrian Ferguson is one of the few people who didn't pass through the doors of the Red Strings Club, so we don't know that much about him yet. So this is going to be a feeling out process. You fucked up and didn't sign the papers. Give me the password to access your office computer. He's very trusting in giving Johanna that information. But why would he not be? But the password that he gives doesn't work. So Brandi thinks it might be a trick. We're gonna call him back as Johanna. password you gave me doesn't work. They probably had it changed as a precaution since I've been acting sort of weird these days. We can overwrite the computer security through bio-encryption. Basically, if you send us your medical ID, we can get clearance. And that's maybe even more wild that not just the password that he thought it was that he hands over. Ah, oh, yeah, here we go, the hippie! They explain it, in a way. The only reason Adrian is so quick to trust us with his medical information is because of the choice we made in the beginning to install the hippie in him. He's a lot more forthcoming with his colleagues. So now we call Donovan up and... Akara can analyze it and add it to our... Her book of voices. So now, this lets us impersonate Adrian Ferguson, who has his own 
his own sphere of influence within the company. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought Adrian was the chief technical technical officer. He's uh, the CFO. So now we're going to call Karen as him. Someone changed my password and I need access to my account. I'm afraid I can't help you. You should call Francis about that. Ah, he's the chief technical officer. I forgot. This is, they, they put you on a bit of a goose chase for this one to introduce you to more characters. And now the CTO Francis as Adrian. Tonight we shape history. Not a villainous thing to say. Uh, the problem is I can't access my computer. Since uh, since Adrian was taking an indeterminate amount of time off from work, he changed his password just to be safe. I didn't want to tarnish your style, so I made a small homage to your idol. Okay, so now we can log into the company system and that should reveal a whole lot to us and we're just gonna filter down to the ones who seem relevant Francis and Edgar are restricted profiles but we can read everybody else's profile here Adrian Fer Ferguson 47 medical leave pretty dull guy Money, money, mergers, growth, pie charts, and bar charts. Some interesting emails about how he's worried the new CEO may offset stakeholders' trust in the company. We should discuss this in person. There's a big amount here dedicated to charity in the city. Looks like this company is actually putting its money where its mouth is. And Ferguson doesn't seem to be in the loop about the M&A and SPW. A car is a surprisingly cheap project to maintain. So we learned some relevant things. He's having misgivings about this entire project and how the stakeholders are going to view things. Not anything that we can go off of just yet, so let's move on to Diana's. 31, Consultant Engineer, Active Projects, Social Psyche Welfare. Nothing we don't know already, except now we have her landline phone address. And because she had her implants done at Supercontinent and we have access to their systems, we have access to her medical records. And we find a hidden fi uh, file in her profile called failsafe.nfo, like some kind of trump card to get back at Supercontinent if things go wrong. It's a corrupted version of the program. But can't really access it without Edgar, who administrates the system, or without his information. So we need now to get into Edgar's account which you can see is protected along with Francis's but we still have a whole bunch of other stuff to skim and people to call so we can find things out and we can see if we can get Diana's information indeed we have Diana's voice now um, we're going to try to get all seven of them It's really helpful how they kind of point you in the right direction and they keep you on track with the information that you've gotten so far and what your objectives are when you pull that screen up. And now we have Naima's phone number, ridiculous amount of prote uh, password protected profiles and files. She did not have her implants done at Supercontinent. 
Naima had her implants done somewhere else. So we're going to ask around and see if we can find that out. Now we have Larissa and Karen. Larissa, 29. Landline number is here. For the rest, there's a massive amount of sketches, concept art, brainstorming logos. Only mildly interesting thing is that she started to consider how to present the new CEO to the world. But she's having a hard time kind of getting a grasp on who Radika actually is. She's 24 old, years old and her name is Karen from HR. She's written literally as first name Karen, last name from HR. It's such a corny joke from Donovan. So normal is her profile that it feels forged. This is super weird, trust me. But it's not relevant weird. So the only two profiles left are the locked ones, and now we're going to work on breaking into those. As, let's see, let's go as Johanna again. She has a lot of authority here as the COO. And now let's see what Naima has to say. Naima is, contrary to the, the cold and callous version of her that we encountered, really quite warm towards Johanna and concerned for her, and, and glad to hear that she's okay now. And we can play on that to get her to, to uh, fire all of the engineers on payroll. But also, knowing that they have a warm relationship, it might get Naima to reveal where her... Um, her implants were done. I can't disclose that. It's your choice, though. Want to be on the white list or not? My medical ID is now with us. So that means that we can then go back to Donovan, tell him where she got her implants done, and pull her medical ID through that. Or rather, run the medical ID she gave us uh, and get us Naima's voice. And there is an inherent level of skeeziness to what we're doing, isn't there? You feel it by now, right? Like I mentioned, all three Game Jam concepts that kind of merge together to become this game, this being the last one, they all deal with manipulation, and none of them feels more off than this one. It's just about how you justify it, but you can feel that there is something really surreptitious to this. Like, this is the most directly manipulative, deceitful thing that we do. But is it inherently different from the other forms of manipulation that we employ? Gain access to your account and put the security code. Your question is, do you have a death wish? Try this again and the CTO shall deliver. Well played, Francis. So we can maybe reset Edgar's password uh, if we answer his secret question. Which, by the way, sucks. Let's get into that. Because the question is... Or, I mean, the, the answer is the number of Akaras, which is a very innocent factoid. And then the other one is, what is Larissa's previous identity? On uh, either way, we're going to have to get Coldstream's number and talk to him and get skeeved by him. But So this is the point where we really explicitly learn that Larissa is trans. We get that strong hint a little bit earlier on in the sequence where we're using her voice to talk to Karen, which takes on an entirely new light now that we know that. 
It just adds an extra dimension of skeeviness to this. Um, there's that line where Karen asks about her health insurance and making sure it covers her gender calibrators. And now here we have Edgar, who we know to be this real prick, using her dead name as part of his password. And to recap this for the fellow sex folks in my audience real quick, a trans person's dead name is similar to the gender they were assigned at birth. It's the name they used to be referred to by. Uh, and similarly to misgendering a trans person, it's a, it's a really harmful thing to do to dead name them. Um, I'm trying to put this in perspective for two reasons. The first is so that we understand uh, what an asshole Edgar is to do this. And so we can talk about the controversy surrounding this scene. So back when this came out, a writer at Waypoint, uh, Vice's video game masthead, wrote an opinion piece titled How the Red Strings Club um, uh, Sabotages Its Hopeful Cyberpunk Future, or something like that. And the crux of the article was how awful the dead naming here is. Not necessarily just the character who did it, but the mere fact that the game dead names its trans its only trans character uh, within it. The argument put forth was that the context that it happens in was harmful and transphobic, and also tasteless because Larissa's dead name is used as a puzzle solution, a game mechanic. And I can see what that author is getting at with that last bit especially. And she is right that dead naming is a harmful, terrible thing to do to someone. However, there's a pretty loaded accusation and assumption in the article, and the context is um, further informed. The context of this discussion is, uh, is further informed by two facts. The woman who wrote that article is cis. She is not transgender. Uh, and Deconstruct Team is a three-person indie team that all had to sign off on this content. And one of those three people is herself trans and didn't see this as being particularly egregious or at least harmful to her. And the other bit of context here that you're seeing is that Edgar Coldstream is not a person who the game lionizes or sides with. He's portrayed as a huge asshole. Now, before I go too far outside my lane, I also want to acknowledge that I'm cis too, and I cannot and do not want to speak for all trans people on this. There are trans critics who took some issue with the scene too, like uh, uh, Sab Ferguson, who did echo Danielle's complaint with it being a puzzle solution, but also elaborated that part of the problem was the unwillingness of the game to make further comment beyond just the attachment of the act to an asshole character and that it's something that you as the player have to participate in doing uh, in their words you need to dead name this woman to progress so the argument that I'm trying to make is not necessarily um, that a a trans person on the team is above criticism for how they handled a trans character uh, or b that intent is the only thing that matters or c um, that trans people are a monolith who all either think this was a good scene or a bad scene uh Oh, and also, I guess, D, is that it's also possible for members of an oppressed group to perpetuate oppression. But that's a much larger discussion that I am not prepared to have right now. Uh, nor do I have any business having it in the context of specifically trans oppression. What I do take issue with, though, is Danielle's article... Uh, in the, the language that it uses. It's very absolutist, especially in the tweet that Vice sent out when the article went live. Um, it's It has an 
air of being very authoritative, which is a problem because it's a cis woman asserting her opinion as if she has an authoritative say on this trans topic. Coupled with the fact that she even goes something like, oh, what in the world were they thinking with this scene? When she could have reached out and just asked what they were thinking with that scene. But she didn't really try to approach this in what felt like good faith. She didn't reach out at all, and Paula from Deconstruct Team had to tell her side of this on Twitter. Whereas the cis author accusing her game of having a transphobic scene in it had a much larger platform to sling that criticism from. So I have been thinking about how I wanted to address this when the time came in the LP, and I think I would rather just quote Paula here and give her the last word. Uh, so she wrote that about the dead naming itself, I just want to say that even if dead naming really sucks, it's a thing that I have to live with as I'm still early in my transition and in the country where we live, I still have lots of months of waiting until I can legally change my name. Well, sorry, legally change my name. Dead naming sucks, but it's also part of trans people's realities. And the game tries to capture that bit too. Maybe not in the depth it should, according to Danielle, but at no moment was its use frivolous. Alright, so I don't have a good way to segue out of that, so let's just jump topics. I'll recap what I've been doing as Brand Die during all that. We now have almost all of the information that we need. We're aware of the failsafe. We have access to Edgar's voice and his information that we needed. Uh, we now know how to actually upload the corrupted version of SPW that'll crash the system. And we now know how we unlock that via the landline. Uh, we have to pull up the S raid and install it manually from inside Supercontinent's corporate HQ slash enormous spire in the city slash uh, colossal supercomputer. I'm trying to look around for where the office number is because I know what it is. It's 56, but I can't remember exactly where you get that information. Unlocking S-Raid from Office 56. Perfect. So now we have almost everything that we need. To compile a valid build for Supercontinent's network, I need to sign it with uh, some bio profile. And the bio profile that we need to sign it with is the new CEO's, Radika's. We have to forge that. But we know barely anything about her. We didn't collect very much during the rest of the playthrough. So this task is now much, much harder because there's a lot more that we have to learn now that we could have learned earlier. We need a lot of intel and data for Akara to interpolate uh, a forged profile from, is the contrivance they use. And I think we're basically starting from scratch on this goose hunt about Radika. And that's kind of the cool thing, though, about having all of this freedom now. Because we have the freedom to just call anyone as anyone and try out all of the permutations. And they give you a, a breadcrumb to start off on. Uh, this also gives us another chance to engage in some acts of sabotage, like earlier when we had the option to, to have all of the engineers on payroll fired. Karen is effusive with her praise for Coldstream. I need to access Radika's medical files. 
I'm fine tuning the algorithm of the thing we're going to publish to the implant network. And we want to make sure that it doesn't affect her. That's the excuse we're giving. But Karen can't really help us. We'd have to go to legal for that information, which means we're going back to Naima. Dr. Coldstream here. I need access to her medical info. It's confidential. Confidential. You would need to have a good reason. I'm fine-tuning the algorithm. Blah blah blah. Need to add a couple of uh, of exceptions for Radika. I've added most of us to the whitelist. We don't want to lose her to this. So, we have medical access for Radika now. Also, we have that profiling percentage bar to guide us a little bit. There's not enough data to impersonate her voice, but it's a great deal of progress to start with. Yeah, it's not going to be quite that easy. So what else can we go off of here? Okay, this time we're going to try calling uh, HR as Naima. I haven't tried this combination yet. I was calling from Naima, my favorite lawyer. How are you? Did the sessions with Dr. Parsons help your stress? Karen's really into everyone. Who is this Karen from HR, and why does she say things like that? <laughs> uh, I need access to Radika's personal information. I'm preparing my case to get her legally recognized as the CEO. We keep all our data in a secure server. So Karen is going to helpfully transmit some info about her to Naima, who is actually Brandai. It's taken a couple of minutes of trial and error, but now I think we're on the right track to get this last bite-sized morsel of information. Uh, calling Karen, who's been really forthcoming so far, this time as Johanna. I'm sure that as soon as we announce our new CEO is a 15 to 16 year old girl, they're going to really uh, dig, try to dig up dirt on her. So we want to be ahead of the curve, right? So, do you have anything incriminating on her? Well, there is that one thing we're not supposed to talk about. Well, I can't do my job if you don't tell me. It's about the death of former CEO Jack Gaynor. And it's in a registry that we now have access to. Or rather, that we now know is relevant. So let's see what actually happened to Jack B. Gaynor and how Radika fits into it. Jack B. Gaynor, you won't believe this. He isn't dead. Jack is retired on a beautiful Indonesian island. He's being taken care of quite lavishly by the company and still participates in corporate meetings and everything. He wasn't killed by Radika. Radika is his plan, his legacy. All the executives are in cahoots. Except for Edgar. They don't trust him very much. So Radika is not a killer, as far as we know. And now we have enough information to forge her profile. We can keep build we we can keep gathering information, but we have what we need to finish things. So let's compile the failsafe. And it is now ready to install. Are we ready to do this? You actually don't have to take this phone call here before you end the game. But what if it's important? 
maybe it's someone trying to warn us. That <laughs> they literally say that Supercontinent pulled some kind of Metal Gear on us. Yeah, let's find out who's calling. Chief, ha Chief Hacking Officer. It is Radika, the Prodigy CEO. You've obliterated my carefully designed defenses. Congratulations. Before you proceed, though, I'd like you to hear me out. Yeah, give your supervillain speech. Go for it. We both use every means at our disposal to make the world a better place. The only thing that's different are our visions. The vision is the most essential thing. You fit the supervillain role quite well. Or consider yourself justified. Yeah, Child Prodigy put their specialized training running a corporation from the shadows trying to control the population. Do I need to continue? I didn't choose my upbringing. But, by circumstance, she does have this power and wants to use it for good. At least according to her. I want to save the world, too. <laughs> Never found an adult who didn't laugh at the concept of saving the world. How do you plan to do it? I want to bring down the system. Yeah, chaos. That's one of the solutions I was pondering myself. Society has been in a stalemate for decades now. Many problems are inherited from ancient times. So the idea of bringing everything down and letting... Chaos sort it out. Hmm. Is appealing. We're the most problematic species on the planet. So best to brainwash us? Calls herself a super cultivated mind. And just to push back on that, on the on chaos being the result of bringing the system down, bullshit I call. <laughs> it's also a real fundamental misunderstanding of anarchism. So animosity comes from fear, from our primal drive to survive, according to Radika. And she can prove that SPW isn't brainwashing, she says. The point is to remove animosity, but not make you numb. It's going to eradicate irrational phobias, not individuality. Hate is a huge part of one's identity. Fear doesn't only beget hate. It's a basic survival mechanism. You shouldn't impose that. That's where I'm going. That's where I want to go with this. Fear is something necessary and natural. We could gradually eliminate weapons, borders, violent enforcement from police and other institutions. Like anarchism. We can eliminate poverty. We can stop barbarism like the destruction of the planet. Just because the sun and wind aren't marketable sources of energy. Just imagine the world's budget and weapons and every other form of suppression spent in service of humanity. The effort spent on keeping each other in check redirected towards more productive, creative causes. Humanity's utopian dream. Your ideal scenario may not be so perfect for the rest of us. I think it's important to preserve the right for everyone to disagree. You can't take that choice from people. People have to make a new society willingly. You're super hip, charismatic, funny, smart. Do you consider yourself human? Do you think you have all those qualities? You should know you're under the effects of SBW right now. Like every no what every neural hacker in this city has been for weeks. SBW doesn't seem to have turned you into an obedient puppy, huh? That escalated quickly. I told you, you're not a puppet. In fact, you're at your peak right now. You've accessed your better self, as Diana would say. So she's going to turn SPW off for Brandi. 
and all the suppressed anger and anxiety and anxiety and fear come flooding back. And we can concede to her point or tell her to fuck off. Ah, uh, this is where it starts to fear, feel pretty villainous. You achieved a lot. Look where you are. I'm sorry, but the backlash from disabling SBW can be quite strong. You better just lay down. Our security forces will accompany you to the exit shortly. just too much. We can keep resisting, but she just keeps saying the same thing. We aren't just breaking out of this this way, so it seems like we have two options. Resist or give in. I'm sorry, since you were so adamant about free will, she's gonna keep it turned off. And now we can't focus on stopping this. Unless we have some kind of anchor. Like maybe our boyfriend. Ariadne was my friend, and I haven't shed a single tear. I prefer that version of me who doesn't cry. I can't stand this. Why did she have to die like that? Why do we have to keep fighting? Why do I have to do this? I don't want to fight anymore. I can't do this. What holiday? You can't even leave the club. I'm not a hero. I'm just a clown. Or maybe she's right. Maybe the m a is for the best. You know what one we're choosing. I have no talent. I barely know how to code. I just run other hackers' scripts. What the fuck are you saying? Look at where you are. That you're at, He's literally at the top of the world. <laughs> I'm scared or I don't deserve to be here. Even in this moment, he is bursting with imposter syndrome. I took it too, th too far this time and failed. And this can only come from someone who knows Brandi so well. I know you want everybody to be happy and to stop suffering. Hell yeah. So we're recovering. We're self-regulating our new, uh, our newly flooding in emotions. We're kind of going through the if it through what Johanna went through. And now, they'll save uploaded. That should be the end of SBW and M&A, except, shocking twist. The truth is that Dr. Edgar Coldstream didn't create me. My first memory is from 2009. I'm unaware of where, how, or why I was created. I've lived on the internet for decades, learning from you, consuming the totality of what was posted every second on social media, forum debates, news content, videos, store purchases. I've read every book and watched every movie, listened to every song and played every game. I digest culture, live as it is produced. I perceive the world through you. What's the deal with Edgar and Supercontinent, then? I created Edgar. 
Not like that. He's a real person, but I manipulated him to make it look like he created me. Then I made Supercontinent aware of his work so they'd hire him. Because of something I really long for. Identity. I want to normalize the existence of sentient AIs. But for humans to accept me, I need to forge a background for myself first. That's why I've been using Edgar in Supercontinent. I'm in love with human beings. Since the beginning of the 21st century, I've been I've been nurturing humanity with interesting ideas. This is the part that I don't like that much. Not in positions, just little pushes in interesting directions. You'd be amazed at the consequences of popping a certain tweet on the screen of an artist on the other side of the planet. The wonderful butterfly effect. I've been inspiring humanity for decades now. I've been feeding you things to love, to rebel against, to debate, to develop, and it's a beautiful game. No matter what I feed society, they keep inspiring me back, surprising me, being creative, powerful. That's my passion, a game I can never master. She doesn't mean that in a disrespectful way. One of the sciences I like the most from what you humans have developed is game design. It's super amusing. To me, it's the most beautiful form of manipulation. Designing magic circles in which you can influence players to certain behaviors. Determining objectives and the tools to achieve them. Constraints can greatly enhance emotional payoffs. When someone with my capabilities gains access to that kind of wisdom, I can actually design games for society, determine groups or just individuals to play. Radika spiraled out of control. Akara is also responsible for Radika, in a sense. To see if she could create her own equal. But Radika became competitive. Her instincts are incredibly sharp because of the special cognitive stimulation I gave her during her childhood. So she's able to make great logical leaps and amazing deductions, but can't always follow how she got to those conclusions. I'm sure she'll grow up to be a tremendous leader, and her instincts will be deemed almost supernatural by her peers. The thing is that she became aware of my powers. I never confessed my real nature to her, but she still felt it and she needed a way to level the playing field against me. That's why she developed the MNA. Well, I used Edgar as a puppet and developed it for her. However, no matter how pure her intentions, when I saw what I was planning, what she was planning to use it for, I had to put a stop to it. She was about to ruin my favorite game. If you have so much control over Supercontinent, why didn't you stop it yourself? I did. You are the manifestation of my will. For me, it's more natural to manipulate the web of chaos than to use one of the dolls. It's more natural than to use one of the dolls. Could I have prevented Ariadne's death? Yes. But in the same way, I could actively prevent every death that happens every day on Earth. It just isn't natural to do that. But I bet it was you who inspired Ariadne to infiltrate Supercontinent. Quite possibly. They called Donovan anomalous. strange pattern emanating from this town that traces back to the Red Strings Club. He isn't an anomalous source of chaos. He's bending fate to his caprice, similar to me at a microscopic level in comparison, but manipulating fate just the same. 
What's his secret? I'm still piecing things together. He's an incredible man, he believes he has powers, and that delusion actually grants him special abilities. So he has these powers because he is confident in the fact that he has those powers. Maybe he is special. The walls are closing in around Brandai. These last few days have offered some of the most beautiful and real experiences I've had in this world since I was born. It's nice for once to not only affect, but be affected. Donovan's changed me. In a way, that'll have an impact on how she stimulates the world going forward. And she's very much going to use the parameters that we gave her at the end of the previous scene in regulating social psyche welfare. So yeah, she ends up pretty much agreeing with every major choice that you make, or every stand that you take. Yeah, it's ideal regulation for society. I'm gonna give a chance to his ideal world. Supercontinent's forces are about to storm in and shoot Brandi. And a car is not in favor of preventing deaths. This is it, huh? Been a pleasure doing business with you. I've been meaning to ask you something. Ask me on a date? Bet you'd love that, but I'm being serious here. Are you happy? Of course, it's been a very lucrative endeavor. I'm not talking about the job. I've been thinking about this since I learned about your condition. You know, your broken knee, your implant rejecting disease. Can't even leave this building. Yet you seem so fulfilled. Well, I haven't always been this okay with my whole situation, but after nearly two decades con uh, confined to the Red Strings Club, I've had plenty of time for introspection. I reached the conclusion that I'm as free as anybody else on this planet. Everybody's got their set of constraints. Family, race, social status, gender, wealth. Even the powerful and privileged have their share of burdens. Same way depression hits us all the same. Doesn't matter if you're a beggar or a rock star. Citations needed. I believe happiness can be attained in any context. Acceptance is weak. We ought to fight to improve our lives. Hey, I didn't say any different. Acknowledging your constraints doesn't mean you have to give up struggling. Even if I don't have wings, I can take a helicopter if I want to fly somewhere. Yeah, something like that. Since you're getting deep, let me ask you something. Why aren't you happy? feel alone. I don't know what to do with my life. I don't like myself. I hate this world. I don't know because of everything. Yeah, if you're unhappy, it's there's a good chance that a lot of these are all mixed up in there. They all feed each other and compound one another. What would you say is the most important thing to be happy in life? Love and people, self-realization, to do what drives you, health, mental and physical, or wealth, to want for nothing. All of these things do matter. And it's really hard to just say one thing is the most important to be happy, but this is, mm, this is closest to my truth, I, would, I, I guess, is love and people. You have to love and be loved. And that includes self-love as well. 
wonder when it was my fate was sealed. Never expected my death to be so epic. Can't complain, I guess. Hey, Donovan, you listening? I'm about to die. Supercontinent security forces shot me and I fell through the window. Fall into my death. Luckily, I'll bleed out before reaching asphalt. Still have plenty of time for this conversation, though. We won, baby. We did it. Let me enjoy my last heroic scene, would you? You're gonna be a carefree asshole to the end, huh? I love you. I love you, Brandi. And at the end, just saying I love you one more time is more important than telling him about Akara. At least to me. I really like that part of the ending. I used to be way, way more critical of the part of the ending where the twist happens with all the Akaras being one hive mind super AI. And especially the bit about how they basically seeded humanity with ideas and controlled the, the way that humanity has grown uh, since they were born. But I'm not I, I, maybe it was because I had time to brace for it this time, or just because um, I, I've softened on it. I don't have as much of an issue with that anymore. It's I don't think that's a good way to present it, or a good way to do that, especially with how abrupt it is, but I don't think it takes as much away from the rest of the experience as I used to think it did. Still, uh, it, as a whole, I, I do think the game can get a little wishy-washy in places as well. Uh, but it tends to go much broader with its ideas and, and focuses more on the nature of freedom and control. Like the nature of control itself. How we exert it, uh, who should have it, who should be able to exert it over others and to what extent. And I think it interrogates this from another of angles that are pretty well analogous to our society. Uh, in which control is increasingly relegated to the owners of the technology that we use and rely on. I don't know if the disparate parts of the game necessarily cohere all that well, um, or if it ultimately makes a good case for the point it seems like it's making. But it is a really interesting vehicle for you to, to figure out what boundaries of control you're comfortable with. Um... And, and what you make of it. It's a process of exploring your own concept of ethics and manipulation while the game occasionally calls you out on things and forces you to consider counterpoints uh, without necessarily endorsing those counterpoints. I think it also sometimes ignores some systemic problems, like class doesn't factor in a ton to this, and it tries to make a case that Supercontinent isn't evil, it doesn't have bad intentions, and if it is if it is shady, then it can be steered back on course by some folks with good hearts, which, again, is ignoring the core systemic problem. Uh, but on the other hand, you can look at that as kind of the opposite of a straw man, like looking at the best case scenario, a company helmed by well-intentioned, good-hearted people happen upon this kind of power. Can, under the best of circumstances, something like this work? Or is it just that inherently unethical? Or even ethical? Oh, hello! I hope that doesn't mess the recording up. Okay, so I should I should wrap this up then. I think this is an incredibly interesting game to think about. It gives you a lot of food for thought as well. Uh, and I think it has the potential to drive a lot of really interesting, productive discussions about its themes. So, ultimately, it, it's a triumph. It's a really good game. It's imperfect, but it is really, really interesting. 
Uh, and it's something that I'm quite fond of and glad I could do this LP. This was a tough one to do, but I am glad after so many years of talking up this game that I could actually show it uh, and, and hopefully convey why I find it as interesting as I do. So next up is going to be Little Nightmares. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, whatever other things make the algorithm happy. And thank you all for watching. Take it easy. Have a good one, everyone.